Hey everybody, welcome to Crazy Tech Lab. And today we are gonna be answering a very important question. What cooler is best for the Ryzen 7 9800X3D? And when I say best, I don't mean where the lowest temperatures are. I mean, where the sweet spot is. Do you need to upgrade to custom liquid cooling or a 360 millimeter liquid cooler, very powerful cooling? Do you see a benefit from doing that? Or could you quite easily get away with a cheap cooler such as the Arctic? Freezer 13 that we have here. So we're gonna be answering other questions as well. For example, if you've got a mini ITX PC, you might be toing and froing between buying a small liquid cooler such as the 120 millimeter EK liquid cooler that we've got up there or a low profile cooler such as the Noctua down there. So we're gonna be answering lots of different questions today. What we're not gonna be doing is kind of comparing each cooler here in terms of the actual model. We're not looking at saying, right, this cooler is best for cooling this particular processor. We're literally looking at caliber or grades of cooling and where the sweet spot is for this particular processor. So if you're wondering whether you should go for a very expensive liquid cooler or whether you can cheap out and save some cash and go for a 40 buck air cooler to cool this processor effectively, that is the question that we're gonna be answering today. So I'd like to thank all of the manufacturers here today for sending in their processors. Thanks to AMD for sending the it's Ryzen 7 9800X3D over, and you can see links to all the hardware in today's video down in the description below, and even check out some of the best stuff that I've checked out here on the channel in my Amazon shop, again, where you can find all of this hardware tried and tested here on the channel. And don't forget to look, out those, look at those social links as well and um, follow them, and also don't forget to subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications if you do. It means a lot to have your support. And also don't forget to like and comment down below as well. Love hearing what you guys think of my videos and also liking and commenting just really helps punch me through the algorithm and gets me noticed. So without further ado, let's check out what the best cooler is for AMD's Ryzen 7 9800X3D. So here are all of the coolers that we're going to be testing today with the Ryzen 7 9800X3D. And I've included all of them for pretty specific reasons, but they all represent a specific class of cooler or size of cooler or type of cooler, that kind of thing. So starting all the way at the bottom, we have the AMD Wraith Spire cooler. So this is the slightly taller version of the cooler and uh, was included with a lot of AMD processors in the past. They do thinner ones of these, they do RGB versions, slightly larger ones, but this was one of the more popular ones. So I just wanted to see, for example, if you've got one of these hanging around and you might have an older Ryzen processor. This is compatible with Socket AM5, which is the brand new socket, well, relatively new socket for AMD's processors. So Socket AM4 was the previous one. This one, definitely compatible. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, hey, can I use this with my Ryzen 7 9800X3D? But that is what we're gonna be finding out today. Obviously, saving a lot of money, uh, not having to buy a new cooler, but obviously if you're upgrading from a four core or six core AMD Ryzen processor to the 9800X3D, that's quite a big step up. So we're gonna be seeing how that compares. Moving up to the next one, and we have the Freezer A13X. Now, I should state that I do actually have the box for the Freezer i13X over there, which is the Intel version. I don't actually have the box for this one. I think I must've got rid of it, so I've just used that as an example. But this, as you can see, is the AMD version, and it clips onto the AMD Socket AM5 like that. A pretty small cooler, it's a 92 millimeter fan, I believe. So uh, as you can see, if I bring up the 120 millimeter Cooler Master Hyper, you can see that the Arctic is a lot smaller. So still a pretty good cooler. Um, it's not quite as affordable as it used to be. This used to cost like 13, 15 bucks. Um, I think it's now at least 20 bucks, maybe even a little bit more. So a uh, bit of a shame that it's uh, not quite as good value, but if you're looking at a small cooler, um, 90, uh, two millimeters and obviously pretty low in height as well. I'll just raise up the uh, Hyper again. You're saving a couple of inches of the uh, of the height there. So We'll be seeing how this compares as well. Now the next step up is The Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black. This is the latest version of Cooler Master's very very popular Hyper 212 very affordable, costs about 40 bucks, and uh, I believe it includes fan clips for a second fan, so you can actually hook a second fan in there and uh, make this a lot more potent. It's really potent even, even as it is. Uh, very well made, very, very powerful for the size of coolers. So we'll be seeing how that one compares with all the other ones on test. 
Now, the next one that we have is the Ender 5 45 and uh, this is the dual fan version. They do uh, uh, an ARGB version as well. So this has two fans on it. As you can see, you've got a 120 millimeter fan at the back and a larger 140 millimeter fan at the front. So a good example of a relatively affordable dual fan cooler. Now, the next two coolers I wanted to talk about are primarily for the small form factor guys out there. So we've got the Noctua NHL12S X77. So this is the slightly taller version of the L12S cooler. And the reason for that is because it offers better memory compatibility. So you can fit your memory underneath it. And it is specifically designed for the Fractal Terra Mini ITX case. And uh, I can confirm that this thing kind of slots in very, very nicely and you can close the side panel even with that added height. So the reason why I wanted to include one of these is just to say, hey, you've got a Mini ITX PC, can you use this cooler to cool the 9800X3D? And another option for Mini ITX fans is the EK AIO 120 DRGB. So this thing is an alternative to any air cooler, low profile cooler. And uh, a lot of the time you will see much, much better performance going for one of these than you will for any low profile liquid cooler out there. But obviously it depends on whether you've got space for it, but a lot of cases do have at least 120 millimeter fan mount, which will fit that. Even if you don't have something a little bit larger, like one of the UK AIO liquid units over there. So don't discount 120 millimeter liquid coolers in very tight spaces. I wouldn't recommend using one in an ATX PC because you usually have way more options there. And these things aren't particularly cheap either, but they can offer the best cooling in very tight spaces. So we'll be seeing how that compares later on. Now stepping up to more powerful cooling, I'm just gonna move some things across here. So we have the two MSI liquid coolers here, the Mag Core Liquid E240 and E360, and I'll put up links to these and some other MSI liquid coolers and other liquid coolers in the description down below. So good examples of um, RGB liquid coolers. They're not like the most expensive on the market, but neither are they the most uh, the cheapest. Uh, but they do perform really well. I've looked at both of these on the channel in the past and you can even see how to install them in another video on my channel as well. So uh, these two representing kind of stepping up in cooling from the 120 millimeter liquid cooler that we've got and the dual fan Fortis over there from Endify. And uh, we'll be seeing if liquid cooling and or stepping up from one to the other um, might achieve better results in terms of temperatures. Now, I believe that the bottom uh, cooler here does have slightly slower spinning fans. The larger coolers generally promote better noise levels rather than better cooling. Um, in fact, sometimes the smaller coolers can actually perform better because everything is just kind of ramped up a little bit further. So we'll see how they compare later on. Now, the last step is custom liquid cooling and that is provided by, by my test system uh, Cosmo. So he has an alpha cool water block which is designed to specifically work with socket AM5 processors and it has an offset so it sits directly over the hotspots. So peak liquid cooling over the back here and we've got two 120, uh, sorry, 240 millimeter radiators over the back and a D5 pump. So that's pretty much as, as powerful as you'll get in terms of cooling. So we're gonna be looking at all of these processors now in the cooling charts. First up, we have the gaming temperatures and these were achieved by running Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition for a five run loop, which took about five or 10 minutes. So is a good indicator of a lengthy gaming session. Now we do have a fail line at the end of this graph because I think anything that is easily getting over 70 degrees when you're just gaming is probably a little bit too hot. Now my 9800X3D does seem to run a little bit cooler than a lot of people's samples out there. So bear that in mind as well. So maybe sort of uh, three, four, five degrees or something. But general, generally here, you want your processor to be running at under 70 degrees when it's gaming, because if we run a an all-core all workload on the processor, it's gonna get very, very hot pretty quickly. So you're gonna be easily adding uh, 10 or even 20 degrees to some of these results. So looking at the bottom of the graph then, the AMD stock cooler, which is the Wraith Spire in this case, isn't really cutting it. You're already up to 79 degrees just in game. So a very light uh, CPU load and we're already um, just a few degrees away from the processor potentially throttling there. So uh, a very loud cooler as well when it's running at this speed. The Arctic Freezer um, A13X. Now this is a lot more reasonable. You could probably just about use that 
as a gaming purely a gaming processor a processor cooler but again if you ever come across any multi-threaded workloads you'll see in a minute just what an impact that has on a very very small cooler like that now the uh, the rest of the coolers uh, are more than capable of handling this processor so uh, not to uh, the NHL 12 s uh, 77 so it's a slightly higher cooler than the original L12S and it allows for better memory compatibility and uh, specifically designed to work in the Fractal Design Terra case and uh, that managed to keep the processor at 70 degrees or below while gaming which is a, uh, a pretty good result. Now the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black that's the latest version of the Cooler Master Hyper 212 very very popular very affordable cooler that managed to knock a degree off that temperature as did the EK120 DRGB all-in-one liquid cooler so that's 120 millimeter liquid cooler and it managed 69 degrees C. Now the larger air cooler the, and the Ender 5 Fortis 5 dual fan uh, obviously with a bit more cooling on tap and that managed to knock a further four degrees off at 65 degrees C and then stepping up to liquid cooling we have the MSI MAG core liquid E360 and E240 at 64 and 62 degrees respectively now the E240 I think has slightly faster spinning fans than the E360 so that, that probably um, accounts for the slightly lower temperature in that test but we're looking at maybe one two degrees c uh, within the margin of error here anyway so and then finally custom liquid cooling didn't really cut anything off the gaming temperature for the simple reason that the processor isn't really dumping that much heat into any of the coolers while you're gaming now for the full load uh, all core workload in Cinebench which is Cinebench R24 and using the multi-core test these are the temperatures that you'll see here and as we can see a lot of the smaller coolers really really struggling even in this just a 10 minute stress test so if you're running anything longer than that then you'll definitely want to scrub a lot of the uh, probably the lower three coolers in this graph so as we saw earlier even the AMD stock cooler was managing just about manageable gaming results but here the processor actually throttles so it actually cut back on its frequency because it was getting too hot the arctic freezer a30 next just about avoiding throttling but still at 94 degrees c um, there's no way that you should be using that processor cooler if you will ever be running a multi-threaded workload on this processor because it get, it just gets too hot now the noctua nhl 12s uh, 77 that is maybe just acceptable and after you know 10 minutes a, a temperature of 90 degrees c in a multi-threaded workload is it's not too bad if you're doing it you know uh, ad hoc and it's not something that you'll regularly do um, and for a, a relatively small low profile cooler this is uh, a pretty good result to be honest so it's just about manageable so long as you're not running those kind of workloads too often but the difference here that was quite surprising was stepping up to the ek120 drgb 120 millimeter liquid cooler way better than the Noctua cooler here so just the ability of the coolant and uh, the uh, the pump to just get that heat away from the processor and then to deal with it efficiently with its uh, fairly chunky radiator is just quite impressive so I would say here if, the, if you are running a mini ITX PC you should definitely try and fit this 120 millimeter AIO if you can over pretty much any other low profile air cooler and especially compared to the Noctua if you can but obviously not if you're going to be going for a liquid cooler then you can obviously a lot of the time you might be able to fit a 240 millimeter liquid cooler in there in which case you'd almost certainly want to go for something like the MSI MAG Core Liquid E240 at the top there so again though we see a much better result even uh, than the EK liquid cooler with the Hyper Master, uh, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black that knocked a further four degrees off and uh, for me this is kind of where the sweet spot is I think there's a, uh, a really, really strong case for opting for a uh, 40 or 50 buck air cooler. And the same goes for the Enderfy um, Fortis, Fortis 5 dual fan. Again, those fans spinning a little bit slower than the Cooler Master Hyper. Um, so that's why it only knocks uh, another degree off that. So they're both coolers kind of hitting their limit at around 72, 73 degrees. Uh, C just because that's the amount of airflow that you can actually just that they can deal with with their fans at their specific speeds so uh, obviously a lot cheaper both of those coolers than either of the liquid coolers that we've looked at from MSI 
However, both of the MSI liquid coolers do still offer better temperatures. So if you're considering overclocking and you want to maintain the lowest temperatures possible, it is still worth opting for a, uh, an all-in-one liquid cooler. You, do, you will see benefits even over some of the better um, air coolers on the market. Now, something that we don't have here in the graph is one of Noctua's, you know, $100 air coolers, um, you know, is something really, really crazy like that. That would generally perform as well as one of the liquid coolers here. So you might want to consider that depending on your system. Now, finally, custom liquid cooling did offer a small benefit here but obviously no way worth the extra price that you'll be paying compared to one of the MSI liquid coolers. So it does offer a benefit. And uh, bear in mind, these are all at stock speed. So if you're applying precision boost overdrive or overclocking, you might see more of a benefit from water cooling. Uh, but generally here, I think the middle of the graph with the uh, with one of the air coolers or a, uh, a 240 millimeter liquid cooler is probably where the sweet spot lies for cooling the Ryzen 7 9800X3D. And if you're going for a mini ITX system, you should definitely try and opt for a 120 millimeter liquid cooler, it just seems to be a bit more efficient in getting the heat away from this processor. So overall, I think it's pretty clear that you probably don't wanna be opting for one of the lower end coolers that we saw here today. You definitely don't wanna be using any of the reference coolers that you might have come across in the past with AMD coolers. So if you've got a Wraith cooler, like a stock cooler like this, or a Prism or something like that from your older AMD system, you probably don't wanna be using that with the Ryzen 7 9800X3D. It just about copes in games, but the instant you start throwing all core workloads at it, it will quickly fail. And unfortunately, the same is probably true of the Arctic Freezer 13. So that one did a lot better than the stock cooler, but again, under multi-threaded workloads, it got really, really hot under the collar, even though in games, it was just about okay. Now, the sweet spot for me, I think, is on two of the air coolers that we've got here, the uh, the dual fan Endorphi cooler and also the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black. Those coolers more than capable of handling this processor with relatively no low noise levels and obviously lower price tags than a lot of the other coolers that we've got here as well. The low profile cooler that we've got down there from Noctua also coping really, really well, but it was outpaced by the EK AIO 120 millimeter liquid cooler up there. So that is probably what I would opt for if I was flitting between those two for a mini ITX PC, for example, and had the choice between a low profile air cooler such as the Noctua or a small liquid cooler like the 120 millimeter EK up there. Now that said, you do see benefits by opting for liquid cooling. So the 240 millimeter MSI coolers that we've got here and the uh, 360 millimeter down the bottom, you do definitely see benefits from those. And you do also see benefits by opting for custom liquid cooling. But in general, there's a bigger jump going from uh, one of the better air coolers here to a liquid cooler than there is going from a liquid cooler to custom liquid cooling. So the liquid coolers is probably where I would stop in terms of uh, trying to get the best thermals on this processor because you, I mean, there's diminishing returns right the way across the product stack here, really, apart from when you're moving from one of the terrible processors to processor coolers down the bottom to something more decent like the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black over on the end there. So decent air cooling is kind of what you need for this processor, but you don't need to spend a fortune. You don't need to spend, you know, 80, 90, 100 bucks on a, an air cooler. Something that's 40 or 50 bucks will be more than capable of handling this processor, whether you're gaming, or even running multi-threaded workloads on it. So some interesting findings here today, uh, but in general, there are definitely some sweet spots in terms of price and cooling performance. You don't need to rock for anything crazy. And uh, that's some really good news for anybody that's buying the Ryzen 7 9800X3D. So don't forget you can subscribe to my channel and don't forget to turn on those, no those notifications. And also don't forget to like and comment down below as well just helps punch me through the algorithm and gets me noticed and uh, thanks to everybody who sent stuff in here today from arctic msi and endify ek and amd cooler master all those guys thanks for sending in their hardware and thanks to you guys for watching today's video don't forget to check out all the links for the hardware featured in today's video down below you can buy any of the coolers that we feature today through those links and i just get a little bit of a cutback from that to support the channel. So that's it, thanks for watching, and I'll be back very soon.